Good evening, everyone. This is Ruth L. Snyder joining you from Bonneville, Alberta, Canada. And it is already day eight of our 12 days of Christmas. Thank you for tuning in and encouraging us. And tonight, I'm very happy to have Kim Langling joining me. Welcome, Kim. Hello, hello. And I have, like promised from last night, I got my antlers on. She's ready to rock and roll. <laughs> I act, true transparency. I forgot. Ruth reminded me. She said, you're forgetting something. And I said, what? And she goes, what? you're antlers. <laughs> Couldn't well, let her get away with that. Why not wear them? Why not? <laughs> right on. All right. So, Kim, I will use the same questions I've used with everyone else, but... I might throw some new ones in there since you and I know a bit about each other already. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Right on. Do you call yourself a writer? Yes or no? And why or why not? I do now. I I did not uh, for the longest time, even though I've been writing since 2004. I didn't consider myself a writer. I, I wrote an opinion column that I was asked to provide um, with our local newspaper. I was approached after a large event that I had spoken at. And it was my first public speaking. And they said, would you be interested in, you know, writing a column at least once a month for the paper? And it was all regarding, you know, around surrounded around um, veteran issues. And I said, I've not, you know, I've not ever written. I'm not a writer. And they said, are you a public speaker? And I said, well, today was my first speech. And they said, well, you're a public speaker. You just gave a half hour speech. And who wrote the speech? And I said, well, I did. And they said, well, then you're a writer. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so not knowing what I was doing, I said, yes. And that's how my writing journey started. And I would get beautiful feedback from the people that would be reading the column. I'd get emails and, and, uh, messages through Facebook and things like that, just saying, Hey, really enjoyed your column. Or I really look forward to your column each month. And a lot of them were interviews of veterans and typically combat veterans from all eras. And I, you know, I was blessed to interview uh, former prisoners of war from Korea, as well as world war II and veterans from all eras. And it was a, a very, very humbling thing to do that they put their trust in me. And many of these men had never shared their story before, but they had this nudge in their heart that they needed to get it out before they ran out of time to do so. And looking back mm -hmm. over all those years, I'm like, well, you know, wow, I have been a writer for quite a while. So, but it took me a while, years actually, to actually say, I am a writer. And then I'm published. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm actually an author too. So I would have to say, yes, I am a writer. Yes, you are a writer. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that uh, was your foray into writing. So that's lovely to hear your story. And I'm sure you have an amazing ministry to others that have similar experiences to you with um, being veterans and dealing with PTSD and some of the other issues that some of the rest of us have not experienced because we haven't served like you have. So thank you. You're welcome. So you told us a little bit about what led to your writing. What else would you like to tell us about your earlier years, your experiences? Um, anything that you want to share with us? You know, I'm not a... I'm not one, I, I write from my heart. I, I have no education in that. I didn't go to college for writing. I went into the military. Um, so I've never, that's why I never, I think, considered myself a writer because I don't have any extra letters after my last name. And I would explain that to some people and they'd say those letters, the way you write is is different from so how other so, so many others write. Mine, my writing at least, and I've been able to start seeing it how other people when they read it how they feel. My writing is very empathetic, and very nature driven. And I write the way I see and feel things. 
and that seems to touch people. And when I get comments that, you know, someone will say, I just, you know, I, I so enjoy reading what you write, or you brought me to tears, or you had me laughing so hard, I almost wet myself, <laughs> you know, when I get those types of comments, that is so, I'm almost uncomfortable. Um, and it's so incredibly humbling, because I just sit down and write something pops in my head. And Ruth, you, you and I have talked about this before. If I get something, a little nugget drops in my head, and now I can see that it's coming from God. But when I get those little nuggets and those little nudges, I have to sit down and write it out. I just have to get it out, get it out, get it out. And over the years, I've, I've went to writers conferences. I've taken some courses. I've taken you know paid courses and free courses. I've met amazing uh, educators and other authors that have taught me so much that I'm able to hone, I've been able to hone things, but we're always learning. And for me every day, I just want to be a little bit better than I was the day before. And so every time I write, I am my own worst critic. And I think that we all are as authors, I am my own worst critic. And there's a lot of things that I'll write and they sit for a long time. <laughs> but um, for me, it's just, it's a heart thing actually is what it is. I, I, I'm not coming up with the right terminology. It's a heart thing when I write. It, it comes from my heart. Well, and those are the best kinds of messages. And just so you know, Kim, I don't have those fancy letters after my name either. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Education isn't everything. Education and learning can help us. But I think the best writing always comes from the heart. And those experiences, you know, you have to, I have found that the most creative, amazing authors have had very difficult roads. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that I'm drawn to without knowing it most times. Right. That I'm drawn to, or, and I, now I notice they're drawn to me as well. Mm -hmm. It's like your kindred souls, you know, mm -hmm. you can see something in each other yeah. and being able to weave words together to make it into a story to share with someone with the whole point of it, hoping that whoever has it in front of them, whoever has that newspaper or magazine or book in their hands, that's the person that's meant to have it in front of them. And that it'll provide that spark of hope or light, or they can sit there and say, wow, I, I've been there too. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Or they can say, this was amazing. I just learned something I didn't know. So now I can have more empathy for those people that I run into that might be experiencing this. So it's, that's my end goal with pretty much everything I write. I, I want to provide something to them. Um, I, I'm not a fiction writer. I'm a nonfiction writer. I have fiction ideas in my head. I just haven't followed through on them hundred percent yet. But right now and for the last, well, since I started, it's all been nonfiction and I really enjoy it. And uh, I know it'll, I know it's going to morph into something different because I can feel it. You know, I can feel characters building in my head and I can hear their dialogue and I can see what they look like and what they're wearing. And so I was talking to actually a USA Today bestselling author the other day. Uh, she was on my television show, The Right Stuff. And she was talking about how she has conversations with their characters. And I went, so it's not just me. And she goes, oh, no. Because <laughs> I live in a whole other world most of the time. I'm like, oh, so I'm not completely crazy, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> I just wait until you start writing fiction and the, and your characters take over your story. And that's, and that's what she was saying. She said, Kim, you've already gotten all that stuff, how you just described it. And it's, well, hi, Levi. Hi, Levi. Can you say hi? <laughs> I have horns on tonight. <laughs> Did you see her horns? <laughs> but, um, I lost track of what I was saying. Oh, she had said, um, you've already got it there. 
she goes, you, she goes, Kim, I'm strongly encouraging you to get it down. You don't know where this story could take you. Cause I gave her a little bit of what the story was going to be about. And she said, I encourage you do it. You know, Just don't be afraid to write fiction. And right. so that was encouraging, you know, cause she's a USA today, bestselling author. Mm -hmm. And I still look at myself as I'm just this person writing stories. I'm just penning stories in an old bedroom that I turned into an office, you know, we all start the same place though. Yep. <laughs> Got to remind yep. ourselves of that. And yes. often the best nonfiction writers use a lot of fiction care um, traits, you know, like we have to, in order to get the, the story across, we have to be able to use the dialogue. We have to be able to use, um, you know, see the, the characters and portray them using the five senses and mm -hmm. all of that. And that, um, so even though you might write nonfiction, you're already practicing the crafts that you need to, when you write your fiction. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I've, I've been told that before, you know, similar, similar in a similar way. It's just me. It's my mindset. And that's, that's there's a little block in there for some reason. Um, but I will do it. That's one of my goals for 2022 is to get, I, cause I'm looking at it as not a novel, but a potential uh, series. And it's more on like, it's a little fantasy ish but has morals in it and it's it's around nature and how nature speaks to us so it could be a children's book it could be a young adult it could it could be for anybody so it's still it's things are bubbling you know things are bubbling and brewing we'll see what happens and when it when it does happen when i start that journey and i get all because you know how you get super excited you're like oh my goodness i've got it. you know um i'll let you know <laughs> that will be good. I look forward to that. So what advice do you have for those who are new to writing? When I was asked to write for the local newspaper, I was surprised by that, pleasantly surprised. And I said I wasn't a writer, but then I said, okay, anyway, and I just did it. I just did it. That's how I started writing. Now, not everybody starts that way, writing for a newspaper. So you know that your stuff is going to be out there immediately, right away. My first thought is, anyone who's writing, just sit down and do it. Whether you journal, maybe you've been journaling for years, you've been writing. You're, you're a writer. You have a, an idea that sparks in your brain, get it down on paper. Who cares if it makes sense? Who cares if there's typos? Or it's not, you know developed fully get it down get it down and how i do things when i come up with an idea i write stuff down and i've done this from the get-go um i'll write stuff down i i, I call it word vomit <laughs> i will sit down in front of my computer and i'm like Brrr, and i just get it out get it out get it out and then i walk away i walk away for a day or two and i always say i'm gonna let it simmer just gonna simmer and then i come back and reread it and see if i get it because when you get in that zone, when that story comes, you just have to get it out and it might not make sense, but at least you got it out. So just, just do it. No one's judging you. It's, it's all on, you know, there's no pressure. Don't put pressure on yourself. If you want to start writing, start writing. And when you do start writing, as Ruth mentioned earlier, the five senses, I am a firm, firm believer that when you write, you absolutely have to use all of those. So what do you see, hear, smell? touch if you touch it what does it feel like use those words those emotive words that are going to pull those people into your story and you'll have an impact on them so if that makes any sense that's my advice <laughs> can't hear you i was saying it makes lots of sense to me hopefully it makes sense to the listeners as well <laughs> <laughs> uh, a tip that somebody gave me that I use sometimes when I'm struggling with whether I'm 
putting an idea across well um, is after you write a passage, go through with um, five different highlighters, one color for each sense, and highlight each word that uses the sense of sight, for instance. Yeah. Use another one for the sense of smell. And then when you look at it, you'll be able to tell if you have all five senses. And if you don't, um, then you'll be able to add that. And if you do have five senses, sometimes, um, like I'm a visual learner, so I tend to tell more about what things look like. Mm -hmm. And that gives me the opportunity to add some of the other senses and, and make them stronger. What a great exercise to use five different color highlighters. Mm -hmm. I just, I always have a list. Okay. So when I'm writing, you know, I, I make sure that I glance at it every once in a while, you know, the five senses and I'll be like writing something. So, all right. Well, it was windy that day. What did it feel like? What did mm -hmm. I see? Because it was windy. Right. So, you know, I have those, those little things going on in my, I love the highlighter idea that that's, that's awesome. I might use it because <laughs> when I, I type stuff out and I let it simmer, then I can mm -hmm. come back and highlight it. Right. And it'll probably become even more. What a great exercise. Thanks for the tip. That's a nice little nugget that you tossed. You're welcome. <laughs> I love it. Great. So you talked a little bit about you might be working on some a fiction project this year. What other writing projects do you have in mind? I am currently working on a couple of different journals. Um, one is geared toward pet parents. And I worked on that. That's what I was, we were talking off mic here um, that I got into this writing mode for a couple hours today and just, you know, sunk into it. I was working on that today. And the, it's, the book is written from the dog's perspective on how their humans should care for them. So it's been really fun working on this. My goal was to have it done before Christmas. I may or may not, but I'm not putting any pressure on myself, but that's one that's actually from my heart and, and I'm really excited about it because it's not like anything that's out there right now. <laughs> so I'm excited about it. And another one, I want to start a new series. I am the lead author and coordinator of the three book series, When Grace Found Me. So in 2022, I'm going to be starting another series called When Hope Found Me. And so I will be, you know, putting a call out for co-authors for that project. And I'm, I'm excited about that because the When Grace Found Me series went really well. And I met some amazing women that I'm still in contact with. It was just amazing. So those are the two main ones that I'm working on. And then uh, my podcast, I'll continue to do my podcast, which is Let Fear Bounce. And then soon to be released, my television show, which is called The Right Stuff, which is W-R-I-T-E, The Right Stuff, The Author's Voice. So that'll be available on 11 different online platforms in over 250 countries. So that's kind of a big deal. And I'm pretty excited about that. So when that gets launched, I'll be able to share others, other authors stories and stuff like that. So it's going to be a fun journey. I'm looking forward to it all. Sounds wonderful. So I'm going to put up a banner. Let me make sure that I get the right one. That's your website, correct? Yes, it is. All right. And then you mentioned the name of your TV show. The Right Stuff. Yep, that's it. And I'm just putting a banner up for your podcast let fear bounce and that's available on all the podcast platforms as well i've been doing that for a year i started that a year ago it's been it's been amazing people come on and share their journeys and um how they were able to push some of their fears away from no matter what it was that they were going through every we all have fears in our life at some point and i started let fear bounce um a year ago kind of like in the height of the pandemic and um I woke up one morning and said, I refuse to live my daily life in fear. Not going to happen. I'm going to let it bounce. And then I went, oh, let fear bounce. And I literally said, I think I'll start a podcast. I had no idea what I was doing, but I started one that very day. <laughs> and here I am a year later 
And I have 79 episodes. I'm going to close out the year with the 80th episode. So I'm, I'm actually pleased with myself getting 80 episodes out in 12 months. And I just got a thing the other day with your data and stuff. And it says, I am regularly listened to in 11 countries each week. And I went, wow. <laughs> Oh, Congratulations. Good yeah, that you. was so fun. I don't know if that's good or not for podcasting, but to me, I'm like, I'm, I'm super excited about being a turtle. One slow step at a time. And I'm just going to do my thing. I'm not going to put pressure on myself. I'm going to roll where God is telling me to go. And uh, so, yeah, that's, you know, just these little things that pop up random, not, they're not random, but no. and they pop up and you just go, Oh, wow, 11 countries. People regularly listen to me each week in 11 countries. Wow. I was surprised. I'm like, they're listening to me? <laughs> well, maybe you're not a turtle anymore. Maybe you're a reindeer now. Uh, maybe I've graduated to something just a little quicker. You're right. What's what's just a smidge quicker than a turtle? I don't know. But you got that way <laughs> on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anything it's else fun. you'd like it's to tell fun. us? The journey is fun. So, <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to tell us? No, I think I, I think I covered the most of it. If anybody has, you know, questions um, or they are interested in wanting to write um, or t participate in an anthology, just hop on my website and you can shoot me a message through there. It'll come directly to me, and we can chat. If it's something that you're interested in, and obviously there's no pressure. You want to just chat about your dream of starting writing? Shoot me a message. I love talking to people that want to write. That's great. You are a wonderful encourager and very so authentic. I love that about you. Thank you. So I'm going to bring Phil onto the stage as well. Welcome, Phil. Hi, Phil. You need, some, you need some antlers too. <laughs> you're, you're muted right now, Phil. Okay. Sorry. Yep. I'm glad to be here. You nice need some to antlers you too, Phil. I, you know, um, I probably do. <laughs> You don't I, sound really confident about it. <laughs> well, you know what I what I might have available upstairs in my daughter's room is, um, it's the uh, uh, Jack Sparrow, you know, dreadlocks with the <laughs> headband. That you'd look awesome. Yeah, that's why I get a little hair, you know. <laughs> Well, oh, maybe while well, some of us are reading, you can get those dreadlocks. I, I, would have to, I would have to dig around. I don't know where it is. Oh, oh darn. Okay, well, well, you know what? Well, today's day eight. We still have four days. Yeah. And she might have taken them with her where she lives now. I don't know. Oh, but listen, I, Ruth is making excuses. So he yeah, is. I, I'm back, back pedaling as fast yes, as I can. Yes, I, I, I can tell. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Go to the dollar <laughs> store and you can get yourself some of these for a dollar. Be careful what you say over the internet. You know? Exactly. Yeah, you be careful because we'll hold you to it. That's you know what? Right. If I showed up in class wearing wearing that uh, with my college students and said, look, if I can do this, you can turn on your stupid camera. Okay? <laughs> All right. There you go. You and have I'll to see what happens. Year. All right. Perfect. What if I do that the first day? There you go. Perfect. They, they'll go, what in the heck is going on? <laughs> what or did I get like, myself What in the here? heck? This is awesome. They might think it's uh, awesome. I, I, I got to tell you this quick story. Uh, I saw a presentation by an alumnus of ours. And he was a magician and engineers, all this stuff. And they, they hired him to teach a course in creativity. So he went to class the first day and just sat there like he was a student. 
and waited. And then, of course, the professor didn't show up. And, and then people started talking. And then they started saying, you know, like mean and nasty things, you know. Uh, and then after a while, he just jumps up and he says, guess what? I'm your professor. <laughs> and then they're deer in the headlights and this and that and the other. And that's how he started out his uh, creativity course. <laughs> that's perfect, yeah. actually. I got, heard their a got their attention. <laughs> yes. I heard a similar story about a uh, fellow. They were having a, a missions conference in a church. And they invited this guest speaker, but nobody other than the people that were organizing the conference really knew who he was. And they they hadn't put his picture on the poster or anything. And so he showed up dressed as a homeless person and made sure that he smelled really nice, you know, like not so nice, um, and went and sat at the front of the church while some of the other people were speaking. And um, then he got up and when, when they called for the guest speaker, he got up and yeah, he got people's attention. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I think that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what he overheard while he was sitting there? Yes, yeah. I think God weeps more often than we know. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yep. Cool stories. Thanks for sharing them, you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, who would like to read first this evening? Phil, you can read first if you want. Okay. I um I had two things, I have two things in front of me and I'm and I'm Well, then I you wasn't can sure. Read, you can read something now and then I'll read something and now. I will read something and then yeah. you can read something at the end. All right. So this is very short. It's one paragraph. My lead in is longer than my reading, but um, I've I've been reading books lately about um, how important it is to um, break things down into bite-sized pieces. You know, we have lofty goals, but it's hard to reach those goals by just saying, I'm going to try hard. You've got to have, you know, break it down into bite-sized pieces, stuff that you can do a day at a time. Anyway, um, so I was trying to prepare a devotion for a group I'm in, uh, guys from my church. And I was trying to figure out how could I tie what I was trying to put together? How could I tie it together? And I was led to this paragraph, this quote, and this is apparently wisdom that's written on a tomb in the crypts of Westminster Abbey by an 11th century bishop. So that's my, I'm going to read this quote. When I was, a, when I was young and free and my imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sight somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years, in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have nothing of it. And now as I lie, lie on my deathbed, I suddenly realize if I had only changed myself first, then by example, I would have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would have then been able to better my country. And who knows, I may have even changed the world. So that's my quote. And now I'm working on changing me. I can get wrapped up in all the social media and all the hype and all of the end no end of, end times fervor, and it's not going to do any good. I'm going to work on me, and hope and pray that that has an impact. 
So that is so powerful. We think we can change the world, but often we do need to just allow God to change us, don't we? Yes. Yep. And we do sometimes end up changing a lot of other people when we allow God to change us. Yes, that's the that's the way it works, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Very, very wise words, indeed. All right, I am going to bring Kim on, and she's going to share something with us. First off, Phil, thanks for sharing that. That was awesome. That that was really good. Put in the comments who that was again, because I'd like to have it and read it. That was awesome. And changing, I, I often say, I might not be able to change the world, but I can change one person's world, one word at a time. That's kind of something that I toss out there a lot. So what I'm going to read for you tonight is not from one of my books, but I was blessed, very blessed. Um, and this is the very first copy of this magazine that was just launched or was launched about a year ago. And I was the cover of the magazine, Motivate Magazine. And I was blessed to be on the cover and have a article in it. So I'm going to share that article with you. Um, this is an international magazine. And the name of my article is The Song of the Wind. Scytherism, the sound, which means the sound of rustling leaves or wind in the trees. It's such a gentle word, bringing to mind the seasons we have all lived through and all of the changes that come with them. And have you noticed that in nature, each season brings forth a different song from the leaves as the wind whispers through? Winds blowing through before a spring thunderstorm and the young leaves having just unfurled, emitting a soft whisper. Have you paid attention when a heavy, humid breeze on a hot July day rolls in and the leaves are still in quiet, as if they too have been sapped of energy and need to seek shelter from the heat? A chilly October breeze blowing through the trees, leaves that have begun their yearly change from soft and fluttery to crisp and quick an entirely different song they sing as they dance. As the days become colder one by one, the leaves swirl and float upon fall's cool winds, gently landing on the ground. Thousands of leaves now creating a beautifully colored carpet on the ground. And as you walk, you take a deep breath and sigh. Ah, fall. Flashing back to childhood memories of playing and jumping in piles of crunchy leaves without a care in the world. Do you remember those days of your youth? Spring arrives and you watch as the buds on the trees arrive and then as if something magical has happened, the following day there are new leaves everywhere. What of those long hot summer days when you would take refuge in the coolness of the shade of a tree or those early fall days that you would notice the colors of the leaves change just a little bit each day? A cold November day heralds in a gust of wind and the leaves that have continued to cling to their branches whirl and fly from the trees as if they are taking a final leap only to land on the ground for us mere humans to shuffle through as we listen to the crunch underfoot and breathe in their end of season scent. And winter approaches. The leaves begin to fall and be blown hither and yon, floating along on cold bursts of wind. Your heart may be saddened at the ending of yet another season, knowing that there is now before you a long, cold wait before you will notice those buds once again popping out on the trees, readying themselves for another season of dancing and fluttering in the wind. Sounds of life beginning and ending can all be heard as the seasons change and the wind blows through those leaves on all of those trees. Scytherism, a soft word bringing to mind whispers, gentle breezes, and change. And that's my story. Wow, so poetic. Thank you. I love how you described the different seasons and you tied them all together with wind and leaves. It's a dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we can choose to dance through the seasons or we can choose to uh, mope through the seasons. Exactly. <laughs> yes. You caught the message. <laughs> you communicated very well. <laughs> Did you notice how I used my senses? 
<laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me share that. I haven't read that in a while. And I was thinking about what to read tonight. And I was like, you know, that's, I think that's what I'm going to share. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, so I decided I'm going to read a little piece, a little story that's in this Christmas Stories and More. Um, I belong to Inscribed Christian Writers Fellowship, which is a Canadian, Canada-wide group for Christian writers. And we have put out three anthologies now. The first one was one for writers. The second one was this Christmas one. And last year, we just put out Easter Stories and More. And they are available on Amazon. My story in the Christmas Stories and More is called Hope for Jimmy. And it's more of a children's story, but I don't know about you. I think that children's stories um, speak to people's hearts no matter what age. So I hope that this is enjoyed by you. Even under two blankets, four-year-old Jimmy lay shivering. It had to be the coldest night of the year. Then again, any night was cold during winter out on the streets. He rolled over and felt a sharp poke in his hip from a pebble under his cardboard bed. Although his teeth chattered, he was happy. I'm dry. I ate today. Mama will be back soon. And I'm safe. He peered into the darkness and listened intently as footsteps drew closer. Jimmy, it's Mama. He sighed with relief. It was scary when she was away. What would happen if she didn't come back? Who would take care of him? How would he find food? He snuggled back into his blankets and closed his eyes. He was tired. Now that Mama was back, he could relax. Jimmy, wake up! Mama shook him. You need to get up. Jimmy's tummy rumbled. He rubbed his eyes and sat up. The sun was peeking over the horizon. He stood quickly, stomping his feet while folding his blankets. Mama folded the cardboard. They stashed their makeshift home and blankets behind a nearby dumpster. Thanks for your help, Jimmy. You're a good boy. Mama smiled at him. He returned the smile. I'm taking you to a center. They'll take care of you and feed you while I go to some job interviews. Jimmy looked down at his boots. The smile slipped off his face. Can't I come too? I'm sorry, son, but people don't take kindly to kids tagging along for job interviews. Remember, I need a job so I can earn money to buy the things we need. He nodded his head slowly. He did not want to sleep on the street forever. Maybe if Mama had a job, they could live in a real house. Maybe he could even have a dog for a pet. He bit his lip. He would be brave, just for Mama. He wanted her to be proud of him. Ready? He nodded and placed his small hand into hers. He could see his breath as he walked, but his body felt warmer now that they were moving. As their boots crunched in the snow, Jimmy heard music. The words said something about a manger for a bed. What's a manger? Mama looked puzzled. That music, it said something about a manger for a bed. Oh, that, she looked sad. Some people say that baby Jesus's mother put him to bed in a hay, in hay in a cow's trough. Jimmy wondered if that would be warmer to sleep in than his cardboard bed. Mama, what does that sign say? She paused. So many questions. Her eyes twinkled. It says, no parking, shipping and receiving. Jimmy wrinkled his face. What's that mean? Mama started walking again. That's where big trucks pick up and drop off things. Someday I'll drive one of those trucks. Maybe, now hurry, we're almost there. A few minutes later, he and Mama walked through a door into a building. It was as warm as a summer day with the sun shining on his face. 
Mama talked to two ladies. Then a door opened and he saw some children playing with toys. Hi, Jimmy. My name is Marta. I'll be looking after you until your mom gets back, okay? He gazed into her chocolate brown eyes. She looked kind and her voice was gentle. Jimmy nodded and waved to Mama as she walked away. So that's just the beginning of my story. If you would like to read the whole thing, it's in this book, Christmas Stories and More. And I think Phil has something else to share with us. Are you ready, Phil? Yeah. Um, this is a this is also from my book that I've shared a couple things from. Um, you know, sometimes unexpected opportunities arise. And uh, I had something happen uh, on a cruise I was on. And, uh, and so I, I wrote about it in my book. It's just uh, one, two paragraphs. Um, in the, so we were on a Viking River cruise from um, Basel, Switzerland to Amsterdam. So we started on the Rhine and we went on the Rhine all the way to Amsterdam. But I noticed on the map of where we were going that we were going on the portion of the Rhine because there's several of them. There, we were going on the portion of the Rhine that was going uh, through um, the Netherlands in Nijmegen uh, under the bridges that my uncle helped capture in World War II. And he's, uh, he died about five miles from there, uh, just a couple thousand yards from the Rhine River. So I, I managed to figure out when the ship was going to be going by there, because it could have been in the middle of the night, uh, but it was going to be going by there around 9.30 in the morning. So I offered to the social director of the Viking cruise, I said, we're going to be going through Nijmegen. Um, I would be happy to share my uncle's story uh, as we go under the bridges that he helped capture in a very famous battle. Well, luckily, the cruise director was familiar with the battle, and he would also talk about it as we went well, not as we went through Nijmegen, but just saying where we were going uh, that day. And so he got permission from the captain of the ship for me to speak. So um, about an hour before, and he announced that I would be speaking, and about an, an hour before uh, we got there, they mic'd me up, and people had their own uh, tour guide uh, receivers so they could listen. So uh, I'll read this now. Um, I've already said part of it, <laughs> not thinking ahead. Okay. In August 2015, Judy and I took a Viking river cruise from Basel, Switzerland to Amsterdam on the Viking Eyre. Via satellite tracking of a Viking cruise a few weeks prior, I determined that our ship would pass through Nijmegen around 9.30 on Thursday, August 20th. I spoke with the social director, Ryan Cofrancesco, and offered to tell Uncle Dave's story as the ship passed under the Nijmegen bridges. He was familiar with Operation Market Garden and got permission from the captain to allow the presentation. About an hour before arriving in Nijmegen, we began the presentation from the bow of the ship. I was expecting a dozen or so people to show up and listen. Ryan must have done a pretty good job selling the presentation because about 100 people were gathered on the bow, in the lounge, and on the top deck to listen and watch. The presentation went well as I went back and forth between Uncle Dave's personal and family stories and the fascinating history of the wall crossing and Operation Market Garden. It was no surprise that there were some World War II buffs on board, and several approached me afterward and were very complimentary. This experience was the highlight of the trip for me and reconfirmed the value of the journey to find Uncle Dave and bring him home. 
And so uh, I think it turned out that my most significant, you know, event on that whole cruise was something that wasn't even on the schedule. It was just something that that happened. And I think when you're telling this telling a story and you're there where it happened, it has a little more impact than if you're somewhere else in the world. So anyway, that's thought I'd share that. That's awesome, Phil. That's that's awesome. I have a do we have time? Can I share a short story, Ruth? Definitely. It's a it's actually a World War One story. Mm. Um, my step grandfather in this area was the last surviving World War One veteran, and he was also the last surviving member of the last man's club. And they were the boys of Company B from this area. They were in Fimes, France, um, and the 11th day of the 11th month at the 11th hour when the armistice was signed, they were in Fimes, France by a bridge, a small bridge that they had done everything they could to protect from the Germans. And when the armistice was signed later that night and all the guns fell silent, the mayor of that small village provided a bottle of wine to the boys of Company B from Meadville, Pennsylvania. And the, they decided to not open it. And those, those that had survived to that day, that day they formed the last man's club. And they said that that bottle will remain closed and it will travel from comrade to comrade until the very last one is surviving. And that last comrade, the last man of the last man's club was to open the bottle of wine and toast all of his fallen comrades. My step grandfather was four days shy of his 104th birthday before he passed away. And that bottle ended up with him in his hometown and it was given to him he was living in a nursing home and uh, it was given to him on veterans day. His son, my stepfather went to his room to do the toast to the fallen comrades because he was indeed the last man of the last man's club. And they decided to not open it. They thought it might be just a little bit sacrilegious, you know, and, uh, Grandpa said, no, not going to open it. And so they had a separate bottle of wine that they opened and they did toast all of his fallen comrades. And he passed away very shortly after that. But um, I had the opportunity to go to Fimes, France. And I made it a point while well, I was going to Europe and I said, I'm going to France and I'm going to Fimes and I want to talk to the mayor and see if they know anything about this story. And when I got there through many different interpreters, there was one lady there that understood enough English that she could translate for me into French. Cause I speak no French. I could speak a little German. Um, so it was very interesting communicating, but when I explained why I was there and the woman interpreted for me, the mayor and the, the woman interpreting were, they got super, super excited. And they both hugged me and they, you know, kissed me on both cheeks and they're talking really fast in French. And I'm going, I don't know what you're saying. Um, but the mayor, it wasn't, you know, she, the, the interpreter lady, she um, shared with me and she said, he would like to spend the day with you tomorrow if you have no plans. And he will take you around the village to all of the places that your grandfather was instrumental in saving. And then he, they took the next morning, he picked us up at 9 AM and um, he took me first to his office and one whole wall of his office was memorabilia from all of the different countries and the people that helped save this small village. And right smack in the middle on the middle shelf was an eight by 10 picture of my grandfather in his uniform from world war one. Wow. And I went 
I said, that's my grandpa. And he's like, you know, we, we, and talking in French. And I'm looking at the lady going, what's he saying? <laughs> it was so emotional. And, you know, from World War One, and these people each year have festivities and remembrance mm. ceremonies mm. on November 11th. Every year they go to certain fields where big battles and a lot of people fell and they have a ceremony and lay wreaths and there's a bridge there. That bridge that those boys lived and died to protect, mm. uh, they've named it Meadville Bridge after mm. his hometown. So there's a plaque on one side of the bridge. It says Meadville and it's all in English and then a dedication to the boys of Company B. And on the other side, it's in French explaining you know, and that was um, probably one of the most amazing trips I've ever had. So that would be amazing. What you're talking about Phil, when you said you you're in that spot where that stuff took place, and you had the history behind it, and you could share that with people. As you were, I was getting goosebumps because I'm like, I know what that feels like. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Your story is totally amazing. You know, it's there, beautiful, isn't it? I a, mean, oh my goodness. That's amazing. There's a book there. You ought to read the book called Shot Down by Steve Snyder. And you'll say, oh. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> now I yeah. see. Thanks for letting me share. Yeah. That Shot Down great. by Steve Snyder, that, right? Yep. Uh -huh. You know, I have every night. I take notes. There's always something that somebody shares. You're like, wait a minute. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Awesome. It's one thing to know the history, but it's another thing to see it and to see the places, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know about you, Phil, but I know when I was in Fames and the way that that town, I mean, this is decades and decades later, these people weren't even a sparkle in their parents' eyes when this happened. And they were so involved in it and so um thankful they they thanked yeah. me over and uh, over and over and i said i wasn't even born that was my yeah. grandpa and they're like no but you were here honoring him yeah that they i've gotten thanked a lot over in the netherlands uh by people uh, mm -hmm. for the same thing and I'll, i wasn't there but they thank mm -hmm. our family for right. sacrificing yeah. for us and this photograph that's on my book I love that picture of my uncle sitting there. Uh, that is about, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 feet from where he was actually killed the next day. Wow. And so I got to visit that spot and, and this spot too, right there. Incidentally, there's a um, uh, microbrewery there right now. You could, right where he's sitting, you could sit in there. Uh, sit out in their little outdoor patio and have a beer but uh <laughs> but he um uh, but to stand and see that spot you know and visualize yeah, what happened yeah yeah so amazing stuff yeah i wish more people would pay attention to the history yeah. and learn from it yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well i think I, I don't know. I find that people who haven't been overseas anywhere don't appreciate the freedom that they have. I have to agree with that. Yes, yeah. I agree with you, Ruth. You are right. I I also think it, may, it may be different, you know, for people. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Uh, for me, it maybe it's different because I was in the military. Mm -hmm. Um. And so many people that I consider family all these years later, 30, some 30 years later, I consider family. We all understand each other and, and get it. Right. Um, and to try, see, and that's one of my missions too, is to try and has been for years, especially with those articles I write for the newspaper to let folks that are civilians that have not spent time in the military to help them maybe, maybe understand just a little bit. You know, they won't ever fully understand because they didn't they didn't wear those boots, you right, know, right. Um, but to help them understand or at the very least have empathy for mm -hmm. those who struggle with what they carry. 
Mm-hmm. You know, that's part of my that's part of my mission when I write stuff with veterans and I interview veterans and things like that. And Phil, I'm sure that with your book, I'm sure that that was a nugget in there too. Yes. I, having not served, <laughs> I can't understand, fully appreciate what you went through. And because I didn't experience what what our, our soldiers, our, those that serve 24-7, yeah. And in the case of people that are in combat, where, it, you know, like my uncle, I don't know, probably somewhere between 100 and 200 days of combat. And, you know, in the Bible, it talks about body, soul, and mind. That's what you did when you were serving. Your body, soul, and mind was involved with your mission for years and we don't appreciate that if we haven't done it you know we can read a we can read a book for a few hours and get you know a feel good you know or at least we can appreciate it but we it's different yeah so i try to tell that to people that you know do we realize what these people actually did in World War II? No, we don't. No. And look at World War One. World War One, yeah. shoot. No. And I I one of my favorite people of all time is Sergeant York. And one of my favorite movies is Sergeant York. And uh if you read that, if you watch that movie, um and and realize where he came from as a conscientious objector and he ends up being this world war ii he, a hero um and then you find the same story in world war ii with hacksaw ridge so i know that one yeah well yeah. the world war one version of hacksaw ridge is sergeant york it's amazing stuff yeah. mm -hmm. so much we could learn yeah so yeah so many stories out there that that we lost and continue to lose with the World War II veterans yeah. now. You know, we can only do what we can do and we do our best to honor them and share their stories when they allow us to, so. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things I have said to people is one of my biggest regrets was not having asked more questions when I was growing up of my you know what i had my dad and four uncles in world war ii and my aunt was in the factories building fighters in los angeles and i i would ask a question and they would just give me a quick answer and yeah. and in some cases it was like the conversation was ended right but i realize now that with what I know now, if I knew it then, I I could have asked more questions. I could have done it in a different way. I could have uh, learned so much, so much that I can't now because I can't ask. Yeah, so hindsight's now. amazing, isn't it? <laughs> so I try to tell people to do that. You know, yes. have, there's Vietnam veterans that are people's grandfathers and grandmothers now, and you know. They yeah. went through, you know, there's a lot of them still have PTSD or bad memories, still grieving. But, you know, if, many times you can get them to talk if you do, do it right. So Right. That's that's the bulk of my my veteran family where I'm at. They're Vietnam veterans. Yeah. I'm. They call me the kid. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm 53. You can call me the kid as long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important to remember, isn't it? And, it is. And often we don't take the time to listen. We don't take the time to remember. We think we know everything. <laughs> so thank you for reminding us. <laughs> I love how these conversations just kind of go each night. I love it. <laughs> and Ruth, you you know, you were on the mission field. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot. Well, you, you said it already that going to a foreign country 
is so important to getting understanding. It is. And you were you were in, you know, uh, Botswana. You said or yes in South Africa. Yes, and you saw things I and did. experienced things. My sister was a missionary in Turkey for twenty five mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, uh, so, well, they she, both okay. Ruth, you have to write your story now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was interesting because I came back when we came back to North America. We were, we lived in Canada in um, Three Hills, and I was in grade six when we came back. And when I heard what the kids were complaining about, I just about fell over because I was just like, "That's nothing." <laughs> I had come from a country where people often didn't have food on the table, and to hear uh, what we complain about here in North America. It's, yep. It's, yeah. uh, I catch myself a lot complaining about stuff that means nothing compared to what yeah. other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel bad. Mm -hmm. when we... But at least we catch ourselves. Yeah. Right. So, so let's, yeah. let's be thankful this Christmas and throughout the coming year and change ourselves as we've yeah. been talking about and maybe we can change other people around us as well we can change a part of the world maybe not the whole world but someone small piece of it yes we can